Are you talking to the police in Sweden? How much do they know? Listen, this wacker thing is fake. They fooled us. Yeah, these things happen. Everything she's told me is true. I'm sure of it. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Hello, and welcome to Quick Hits, a podcast brought to you by Borealis Threat Risk Consulting in Ottawa, Canada. I'm your host, Phil Gursky, president of Borealis. Beginning with this podcast, I'm going to start something a little bit different for you. Up to date, I've been passing on short podcasts about terrorism, what's happening, how we're dealing with it, and I've tried to mix things up over the past couple of years. But today, I want to go off in a new direction. So starting with this podcast, I'm going to start doing reviews of a new series that has been airing on Netflix that has an awful lot to do with terrorism. Give my comments on it, what I think is realistic, what I think is purely Hollywood or purely fictional, and weigh in on the value of series of this nature. And the particular series that I'm going to focus on today is called Caliphate, which is a Swedish production. As I said, it's available on Netflix uh, as of this year, 2020. I just watched episode one last night and I have some views on it. And I'm going to try and make time to provide views on other episodes as the series unwinds. So here in a nutshell is what's happened so far. This series takes place uh, in two locales, largely Sweden and Iraq. But before I go on, I want to put a few caveats out there. First and foremost, I am not Swedish. I'm a Canadian. And as one of the organizations that features prominently in this series is SEPO, which is the Swedish Security Service. It is a combination police and security service. I want to stress that I've never worked for SEPO. I worked for CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, which is a strictly intelligence agency without police functions. Having said that, I uh, traveled to Stockholm on several occasions. I have met with SAPO in their headquarters. I have met SAPO representatives around the world, and I happen to have friends who work in SAPO, but I am not a SAPO operative. So my comments on SAPO itself will be limited in nature and more to compare them against uh, a Canadian uh, angle. The other thing I want to stress is that Even though I did work for CSIS for 15 years and in intelligence for more than 30, I did not work as an investigator itself. I was an analyst with CSIS. Although, I must add that I did take part in some human source recruiting and in some human source debriefing, but I was not a human source handler per se. So I want my audience to understand I'm not trying to pretend to be what I'm not. So with those caveats out of the way, let's continue. He was sent by God to you. It is he who step by step will lead you to God's path and help you become martyrs. What we learned in the first episode is that there's a young woman called Pervin, who is a Turkish woman who moved to Sweden when she was 10 years old, ended up moving to Iraq, and I'll get back to that in a second. She now finds herself in Raqqa, which is the so-called capital of the so-called caliphate that ISIS had created in 2014. And she realizes that that she wants out. She has a little girl. Uh, Her husband is an ISIS fighter. And she is desperate to get back back to Sweden. So that's kind of the backdrop of the story. What I found about episode one, it was quite compelling. And I want to comment on some of the aspects of the what happened and how accurate it was a reflection of ISIS and intelligence practice insofar as I can understand it. The very first scene, you have Pervin and another woman walking down the street And all of a sudden, there's this great uh, hullabaloo and some ISIS guys order everyone to start running. And you wonder what's happening. Is there going to be an airstrike? Is there an attack? Are they going to, you know, bomb shelters or air raid shelters? No. They're being ordered into a square where they're forced to watch a man having his hand amputated. This, of course, being one of ISIS's punishments for God knows what. I mean, they did practice in uh, barbaric, antediluvian form of Islamic law in which amputations were de rigueur for I'm sure all kinds of offenses and they forced the population to watch them. Why? Because they wanted the population to live in fear. And they wanted the population to accept that ISIS was the only authority in town and uh, don't fuck up because if you do this is going to happen to you too. That's the very first scene in the movie. 
And I imagine that's actually quite realistic. Uh, I know from my intelligence days that ISIS did do this. They did force people to watch hangings. They did force people to watch shootings, amputations, beheadings, for the very reasons I cited, to instill fear in the population. So insofar as that that, that happened and is portrayed in the Netflix series, I think it's very, very accurate. But let's get back to Pervin. You learn, learn, learn a little bit more about her story. And it turns out, as I said, she emigrated to Sweden as a girl and, uh, you know, went to school. Ended up meeting a man called Hussam, whom I'm not sure if he's Turkish as well, but he was also in Sweden. A bit of a ne'er-do-well. He had a bit of a criminal background. And all of a sudden, he found religion, meaning he refound his Islamic faith. And that Islamic faith took him into the direction of terrorism, violent extremists, and eventually ISIS. And he brought Pervin with him to Iraq to join the terrorist group. Now, how realistic is that? Very realistic. I know of many cases where women follow their boyfriends or their husbands to places like Iraq and Syria. And in many cases, these male figures were uh, not that religious to begin with, somehow rediscovered their faith and ended up, because of being influenced by other people, i.e. violent extremists, decided to adopt a very narrow, fundamentalist, intolerant, hateful version of the faith. So the fact that Hussam went there is actually is actually a very realistic scenario. Now what happens as well in the, in the first episode, which you see a lot of, is not just the violence of ISIS. There's a, an attack that takes place in Istanbul and the guy, some of the ISIS guys are watching on the TV and they're celebrating and they're yelling, Allahu Akbar, God, you know, God is great. And they're promising more attacks and they go out in the balconies and they shoot off automatic weapons into the air. You ever wonder why people do that? It seems to be a celebratory thing in many parts of the Middle East and other parts of the world to shoot off, you know, AK-47s into the sky. You know that the bullets that go up must come down, right? And I'm pretty sure there are stats out there that show how many people die from incoming rounds of ammunition that are shot stupidly up into the atmosphere thinking they're going to, I don't know, escape the Earth's gravity and never come down. Anyhow... A lot of the violence that ISIS engaged in is, is quite front and center in the episode, and that is very, very accurate. Another interesting aspect of ISIS that comes out in the first episode is misogyny and wife abuse. The ISIS guys brag about taking multiple wives. In fact, Hassam, the uh, the husband of Pervin, seems to be having some kind of existential crisis. He doesn't want to kill anymore for ISIS. He wants to get out, and one night he comes back and he takes her on Pervin. He slaps her quite violently, and he shakes her, accusing her of seeing one of the other ISIS fighters as attractive. So he's jealous. So there's a lot of misogyny in, in this first episode. There's also a, a visitation on one of Pervin's friends by members of the al Khansa Brigade, which is a real entity. This was an all-female brigade that ISIS created to help, or rather, to keep control over the females, that is the wives and the daughters and the girlfriends, whatever, that ISIS had by having women essentially act as a Gestapo as a police force that that ensured that they were covered up properly, that they weren't doing things that ISIS didn't want them to do. And so the fact that the al Khans Brigades visits the house of one of these women is actually very, very realistic. These women were absolutely brutal. They drunk the Kool-Aid in terms of what ISIS wanted to do. So the fact that ISIS is a very violent organization is uh, not at all inaccurate. ISIS was and still is one of the most violent, heinous terrorist groups that are out there, even Al-Qaeda distance itself away from ISIS in the, in the mid-2000s when it became the Islamic State in Iraq before it became the so-called Caliphate. You have to, you must get me out of here. I can't let my baby live here anymore. We're going to die. You have to work for me. You're saying you want me to spy for you? I need something to work with. I want to turn a little bit now to another aspect of this episode, which I found interesting. There's a young man called Ibbe whom I, I'm guessing is Middle Eastern. He's, he claims he played soccer in Egypt. It turns out he's a bit, of a, a bit of a sleeper back in Sweden, and he appears to be recruiting two white guys to join ISIS. And he's teaching them how to throw grenades, and he wants them to essentially join the, the movement. And there's a scene in which one of the white guys, which he's not very bright, and he's a few bricks uh, short of a load, 
he ends up taking a picture with all his ISIS paraphernalia in his uh, public housing apartment, just as the public housing people are coming to inspect. And his friend comes and he, and he basically gives him shit for doing this. This also is quite realistic. We here in Canada saw an inordinate amount of, of white guys, i.e. average Canadians, who decided to join groups like ISIS. We have several cases here in the Ottawa area, right across Ontario, right across this country of Canadians who first converted to Islam and then thought joining ISIS was, was a good idea. And uh, if you're interested, I can provide you with the names and, and cases. There's actually quite a few that I, I talked about in my book, The Threat From Within, way back in 2014, 2015. So that's accurate. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about the SAPO, the, the Swedish Security Services perspective. There's a woman called Fatima. She's an agent for SAPO. And uh, you see she's having a bit of a hard time. She's being given jobs that she feels are beneath her as, a, as an actual agent handler. Anyhow, she finds out through a friend that this that Pervin, who's got a phone from another woman in, in Raqqa, that women weren't allowed to have phones. This is illegal. If Pervin's found with his phone, she will be killed. And she gets in contact with somebody. She says, help me. I want to get out. I want to come out. Anyhow, the information is passed to Fatima. Fatima talks to Pervin, and, and this woman talks about wanting to leave Raqqa, to leave Iraq and come back to Sweden, realizing she made a big mistake. And Fatima, of course, is, is not initially convinced of this. And when she talks to her, to her boss about it, her boss says, so you've got a walk-in. Now, what's a walk-in? Well, in intelligence parlance, a walk-in is somebody who literally walks in with information. It happens all the time. And as an intelligence service, your first job is to figure out, is this person lying? Why are they telling me this information? Are they expecting to get paid for it? Is there an agenda here? Are they trying to slander somebody? And this goes to this notion of the ability and the mandatory nature of trying to corroborate information from multiple sources. So Fatima is basically asked to, to try to corroborate what this woman knows, find out more information. Pervin just wants to get out. She wants to leave Iraq and get back to Sweden. And Fatima wants to find out more about an alleged ISIS plot against Sweden. This is a scene whereby one of the ISIS guys says, we're going to do this back in Sweden. Why Sweden? Who knows? There are Swedish members of ISIS, but there are also German members and Canadian members and American members and French members, etc., etc. But this is a Swedish program, and so it makes sense to have an ISIS plot in Sweden. So the, the IO, the intelligence officer, Fatima, is trying to pressure Pervin to find out more information. And Pervin says, are you trying to recruit me? Well, of course she is. She says, look, we're not, you know, at the Swedish travel agency. We have no obligation to get you out of Iraq. You went there of your own accord. This isn't what he said, but this was implied. And in that sense, it's also quite accurate. Security services are there to protect their countries and their citizens. They are there to gather information. They're, they're there to analyze the information. They're there to provide the information to their governments. They're not there to rescue stupid Canadians who thought joining ISIS was a good idea. That's not our jobs. Where the governments want to do that is a whole other issue. It's not your security service that wants to do that. And so the first episode ends with her trying to find out more about this plot in, in, uh, in Sweden. Pervin doesn't actually know anything at this point, so it'll be interesting to see if she starts making stuff up to keep Fatima on the line, to try to keep Fatima interested in her case, to try to get her out. So I, I guess in summing up, I think the first episode was, uh, was fairly good. Obviously, it's, it's Hollywood. It is, uh, it's fiction. But I think that the producers and the writers did a fairly good job of portraying A, the violence of ISIS, B, the way that a security intelligence service would handle this kind of information, and, and C, just the reality of uh, what a terrorist group like ISIS is capable of, both in Iraq, where it's, it, it, it controlled territory and ran the state, and in planning an act of terrorism abroad. So that's it for episode one. I'd like to hear what you think. If you watched the series, do you like it? Do you think it's good? Do you think it's accurate? I'll follow us up with a review of episode two. You can get a hold of me on email, borealisrisk at gmail.com. You can reach me on Twitter at borealisafes, on LinkedIn, or on Facebook. You can also subscribe to all the content that I put out on my website, www.borealisthreatenrisk.com. You'll hit see the subscribe button there, hit subscribe, fill in your information. You'll get all the content free of charge in the mailbox on a daily basis. I'll talk to you again soon. Until then, stay safe.